Hi, I'm Ivan Kuo Fong, a student from Raffles Institution, Singapore. I'm a member of the Computer Science Society of my school, and this is my first coding competition. I'm participating in the Co-Space Rescue U19 category, and the task is to get Co-Space Board points with a time limit of 6 minutes. You collect an object, you get points. Red is worth 10 points, black is 15 points, and cyan is 20 points. You deposit your load and you get double your points. Depositing a set of red, cyan and black objects spawns a super object, and depositing two sets at once spawns a super object plus. They are worth 90 and 180 points respectively. Now that we know what to do, let's get to how to do it. So we need the bot to move first. You know how a car has wheels and the wheels turn to move the car forward? We do the same thing here. The wheels rotate forward and the bot moves forward. Great! Now we also need to turn. Unlike a car, the wheels are incapable of turning in the desired direction, so we instead change the wheel speed relative to the other wheel. The faster wheel moves forward more than the slower wheel, and a net moment is exerted on the bot and something something physics and the bot turns in the direction of the slower wheel. Nice! Now we need to see the objects. Thankfully the bot is equipped with the RGB sensors that allow it to see the area underneath it. However, the RGB sensors appear to take the average of the pixels within its range, so it will rarely detect the object's true RGB value. To resolve this, a range of acceptable RGB values will be given, such that if the bot detects an RGB value within this range, it will know that it is over an object of a certain colour. The bot actually has a rather interesting collection mechanism. By standing still and flashing the light for 3 seconds, the object disappears from the map and appears in the bot's inventory. And so, the bot can go and collect 6 objects to fill up its inventory, after which it would want to deposit its objects to clear its inventory with double the points and collect more objects. The deposit zone can be detected with the RGB detection system used for object collection and deposits are performed by turning the light red for 3 seconds while stationary on the deposit zone. With this, the bot has a simple cycle of collecting and depositing objects that it can utilize to earn points throughout the 6 minutes. However, we can surely do better than this. For starters, there are walls and traps present in the map and a boundary that does not physically exist around the map. To resolve this, we can use image processing to help the bot see the map. Via OpenCV, an image processing module, we can use a program to process the map, then produce directions in which the bot should travel in order to avoid the obstacles and traps on the map. Since the bot has access to its coordinates and the direction it's facing, it can perform calculations to turn in the desired direction. Since the deposit zones are also fixed, we can give the coordinates of the zone to the bot and tell it to travel in that direction, allowing it to reach the deposit zone quicker and complete more cycles in the 6 minutes. Additionally, as you can see, objects spawn in clusters in the map. As such, these object spawning tendencies can be captured with the magic of image processing once again, and directions towards areas more likely to hold objects can be produced at each coordinate. The bot will then be more likely to encounter objects and can hence collect sets faster. However, there are things on the map that hinder our efforts in collecting these objects. See these transparent squares on the map? When the bot enters these zones, its coordinates are set to 0, 0, meaning it can't use the directions that we have created based on its coordinates. To counteract this, we can introduce position extrapolation, guessing its coordinates based on the wheel speed values that we have given the bot. Hence, we can still use the directions that we have calculated. Great! Last but not least, we have to handle super objects. Seeing as they are worth double a whole set, we would want to collect them. However, collecting them while collecting objects will hinder our Super Object Plus spawning abilities. So we will want to leave a whole collection cycle for collecting Super Objects. As the map can only hold 4 Super Objects, we will only collect the Super Objects once 4 Super Objects have been spawned. As the Super Objects are spawned, their coordinates are sent to the bot. Hence, we can provide directions for the bot to collect the Super Objects that have been spawned. To sum it up, here's a compiled flowchart of the bot's thinking process. Feel free to pause the video if you need more time with it. Now, let's see a run with all of the systems implemented.
debugging, yes, uh, debugging. Of course the bot did not work as I wanted initially, and it still does not, honestly. There are features in the simulator that hinder the bot's object collection. For instance, the objects in coordinate nullifying zones have a height to them, leading to bumps that cause the bot to detect objects improperly and at times lead to more interesting outcomes. Also, when the bot moves to a super object that is near another object, it collects the object before the super object, even if the object is further from the bot than the super object is, and the bot does not detect the object at all. This prevents the collection of all super objects at times and fails to maximize points. Another issue I encountered is when exploring reverse movement. Yes, we were this close to a backwards moving competitive bot. The bot fails to turn accurately despite using the same turning mechanism as forward movement. Despite spending much time on configuring the constants used in calculations as well as changing the variables considered, I was unable to resolve the aforementioned issues before this video, unfortunately. There were other problems that I was able to resolve, however. For instance, the calculation of directions using image processing was largely erratic due to a large amount of variable names being present and a large amount of math being present in every line. Only by scrutinizing and recalling the logic behind each line and each function was I able to finally figure out the lapse in logic and get the code to function as expected. This competition has been an enlightening experience as I was able to learn much more about more complicated code and how painstaking the debugging process can actually be. It was only after this experience that I came to understand the saying that debugging takes up 99% of the coding time. I would like to thank my schoolmates and coach for their appreciated support throughout this competition and thank you for staying to the end.